do screen sharing. Screen sharing. Okay. Um, well, I think um, I s think next week I um, I told you I was going to be uh, handing out the take home final uh, next week, uh, next Tuesday, and um, so I thought I would spend some time going over some of those questions in the sample final. But just before I get started with that, let me go here to my syllabus and just remind you where we're at, I think, if uh, I'm, not, I'm not so tired here, hopefully that I haven't gotten totally, completely and irretrievably confused. I think that we're looking at um, these uh, lectures here for today and then for later in the week, these lectures here. And we're uh, still looking at ideas on, on routing. And uh, I mean, if you think about it, the whole idea of routing is really essential uh, to the internet. I mean, uh, it's what makes the uh, the internet work is the is the routing of messages and packets um, back and forth from one point to another, and everything that's involved with with routing. So uh, routing is really the core of everything about the internet, and so these are what these videos are about in here, and if you uh, do take some time looking at these. I think you'll find them uh, uh, pretty interesting. Uh, and um, so these are the, the topics here for this week. Now with that, let me go back and look at the some of these sample questions. Here, let me come back the other way here. Yeah. Uh, desktop, here we go, right here. Okay, I don't know uh, if you've, how many of you have looked at any of these questions. Let me tell you what um, my plan is for organizing um, this final exam. I've told you it's going to be a take home. And if I give it to you on Tuesday and uh, give you until, let's say, Friday to, to work on it, and the whole idea is to give you more than enough time to work on it so that uh, running out of time shouldn't be a problem. Uh, my own experience as a student was when I would do a take home exam that the uh, my grade on the take home exam was directly proportional to how much time I had to spend on the exam. Um, and uh, which I'm not sure that's a, a good way to do it because sometimes people have more things to do. They might have more exams to prepare for and, and so on. And because of that, um, some people don't have as much time as others. And if it hurts them in their grade, it really is not a fair process. I would, uh, and even though you're all taking the same courses and the same exams in the same courses, uh, right now everybody is in a different place being at home and uh, I'm sure you all have different home situations that can be affecting uh, how things go for you. So my idea here on the final is to make sure that you have more than enough time to work on it. And uh, I, uh, I may have mentioned this to you once before. Uh, when I was in graduate school, 
Um, I had one final, was in a math course, and uh, real analysis and measure theory was the math course. It's um, real analysis and measure theory is sort of like real calculus, where I'll say that the calculus that you've had, I'll call that baby calculus. And, uh, and real analysis and measure theory is real calculus. And uh, so um, in this real analysis and measure theory course, we had a take home final and uh, we had five weeks to do the final. Um, and it was really a challenging final. And, um, and, and I took every bit of the five weeks for, for me to do it. Uh, I hope this exam here uh, isn't anything like that at all in, in, uh, in, in your experience doing it. So I'm giving this take home final and um, we have uh, those of you who have been uh, following the course all along from the very beginning of the semester. You, you were attending class when we were back on campus doing the in-class uh, quizzes that I was giving at the beginning of the classes. Uh, and the whole purpose of those quizzes was to try to get people to show up for class and take the quiz. And, um, and many people didn't do that. Uh, and so uh, being uh, forever the uh, forgiving professor, uh, and I decided to take the final and have two parts to it. There would be one part for those of you who took the quizzes um, back in the first part of the semester. And um, for those of you who didn't, I've added a second part, I'll call it part B, which has additional questions on it, which are there for the people who didn't take the quizzes. So if they do part B, they could redeem themselves for not having taken the quizzes. Uh, maybe that's being too generous, I don't know. Of course, anybody could do part B if you wanted to. Uh, and um, so think of the exams gonna have part A and part B. You uh, definitely want everybody to do part A, but if you took most of the quizzes from the first part of the course, that's all you have to do. You don't have to do part B. And uh, uh, it's only if you have a burning interest in uh, doing some of these problems and networking uh, that you might want to do part B. For those who didn't do the quizzes, it gives them a chance to uh, pull themselves out of the fire and redeem themselves for not having done those quizzes. So let's, let me just talk about some of these questions. I don't think they're particularly difficult, but anything is difficult if you don't know how to do it. And uh, it, uh, it's something I've learned over the years and that you know, sometimes I'll try to do something that other people think is really easy and, and I'm having a hard time doing it simply because there's something simple that I'm missing. So I have put solutions that should guide you through finding the solutions to all those questions here. But let me just go through them a little bit and maybe I'll be asking some of you uh, some questions to see uh, maybe somebody can answer the questions. Give me some idea uh, where you all are at as far as understanding understanding how to do these things. OK, the First question is about Hamming code. Uh, eight bit messages are transmitted using a Hamming code. How many check bits are needed to ensure that the receiver can detect 
or correct, uh, maybe I should put and correct, uh, single bit errors. If the data bits are, and I give you a sample, uh, the sample message here for eight bits, I think that's eight, hopefully, yeah, eight. Uh, what is the transmitted byte? In other words, the transmitted byte are the data bits plus the added Hamming bits. So what's the transmitted byte, including these Hamming parity bits? You may find, and now I've put a, a, uh, a I think I put actually a couple of files on the Moodle about this. Uh, one of them is uh, an Excel spreadsheet that uh, goes into explaining uh, the uh, operation of the Hamming code in a fair amount of detail. And uh, and I've given a link here to um, um, to a a, a web uh, information also on the Hamming code. So. You should be able to answer this question um, by using that information. And it would be best, I would prefer if you try to think about it before you jump right to the solution, because if you just jump right to the solution here and and uh, you know read it over and copy it, then you're not learning it. Um, and uh, so the solution here, I put down the steps of doing the Hamming code, and I've got 11 steps here. Mark all the bit positions that are powers of two, and I talk about that here. All the steps down that in in taking the data bits and generating the Hamming byte. Um, then I apply these steps to this particular um, set of data. And that's what that's what I'm doing right here in this section is applying those steps. Uh, and then in the end, I come up with the code word that includes the data bits down here and the hamming parity bits. So this should actually be then the byte that's transmitted that has the hamming uh, error correction on it. Now, if my memory is right, I was going to say there should be three hamming. Um, but it looks like there are four. There are uh, hamming uh, parity bits added here. So we have eight data bits. Then we have four additional uh, bits for the hamming part of it. Let's see, let me go back up here. Yeah. 8-bit message, OK, that's right. And um, so this is the final answer and and how to do, uh, how to answer that question. And I've given a lot more detail on this particular solution than I have in most of the solutions uh, because uh, I think we were just getting to the Hamming code uh, just before uh, it hit the fan there um, uh, just before spring break when uh, classes ended on campus. I left campus. I think right at that point we were talking about the Hamming code. So uh, probably people didn't absorb a whole lot about the Hamming code. Um, now, so that's problem number one is a question about the Hamming code here. Um, I have some probability questions, uh, and they're really straightforward probability questions. I say that if in this message above, the probability of any bit in the transmitted byte being an error is uh, 0.01, what are the odds uh, of having exactly one bit error in the Hamming code and message? Well, you see how many um, 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 data bits there are in the Hamming coded message. And uh, I have 12 of them here. So I, the first 
probability question is what is the probability of having exactly one error? So that means we have one bit in error and all the other bits are correct. And um, so um, that is what I have here. I you know, hope solution number two. I wonder if the solution is, uh, uh, if I've gotten it right here. Okay, there are 12 bits in the coded byte. Each bit has two possibilities, either right or wrong. So there are two to the 12th different ways of to get right or wrong bits. Uh, but there are only 12 ways of getting exactly one wrong bit. So the probability of an error in the first byte, but no other errors is equal to 0.01 times 0.99 to the 11th. This is the same as the probability of an error in the second bit or only uh, in, the, in the second bit or only and I'm not sure what I meant here. An error in the third bit and so on. OK, there are 12 such bits. So the probability of only one bit error is this. Now, um, so uh, now I'm looking at this. Now I'm not uh, actually uh, give you something to think about here. Uh, I'm going to I'm asking you the question here. Is this is this right? Um, if the first bit was uh, probably getting the first bit in error and the rest of the bits correct, uh, that would be uh, 0.01 times 0 0.99 to the 11th. And then we have 12 different ways that that can happen because there are a total 12 bits in the hamming message. So um, I have here that the probability of then having exactly one bit error is this right here. So um, it's uh, so why don't you think about this and um, uh, try to recall? And if you're doing statistics now, this doing these kinds of problems might be fresh in your mind. And uh, so evaluate whether this is indeed the correct solution to that question. Now, there's a similar question here. Number three, what is the probability of having at least at least one bit error? So the question number two was exactly a one bit error. And number three is at least one bit error. So we could have one bit error or two bits or three bits, or they can all be an error. So it's a slightly different question. And uh, typically the way we answer problems like that is that we have two cases um, that are ex mutually exclusive. Either we have no errors at all or we have at least one error. Those are the two cases. And if you know in probability, if you have these two uh, possibilities, uh, you can find, and the total probability of the two possibilities has to add up to one. So it's easier to find the probability that we have no errors and then subtract that from one to get the probability that we have at least one error. So that's the way of doing that, that particular problem. Now, the probability that we have no errors at all, that's pretty easy. That's, that's going to be um, if uh, 0.99 to the 12th is the probability of having no errors. So it's right here. OK, solution number three, the probability of at least one bit error is one minus the probability of no bit errors. 
So the probability of one error is one minus 0.99 to the 12th. And um, this is what I have. You check my computation here to see if that's right. Uh, 0.99 is close to one. 0.99 squared is close to one. 0.99 cubed is close to one. But 0.99 to the 12th, you know, you'd have to I you'd have to put that in your calculator to see how close to one that is. And uh, so this is uh, should give you some idea. Check that solution to see if it's correct. So these are two fairly straightforward probability questions. Um, let's look at this one now. We have uh, number four. And I say the number 667 is a product of two primes. What are these primes? Now, that's a, a question. I, I'm not sure that I went through any procedure for how you might figure out uh, what these two primes might be. And uh, so, uh, I may have talked about it at one point, maybe maybe in the first semester, uh, a question might have come up. But if we want to find um, two numbers that multiply to give us this number right here, it turns out that if we have the product of two numbers is equal to this, um, that one of those numbers has to be smaller than the square root of 667, and the other number has to be larger than the square root of 667. Now, you know that the only two numbers that multiply that are exactly the same value, same size, the multiply to give us 667 would be the square root of 667. So, it should kind of make sense without doing a proof that if we're that one of the numbers, one of the factors in general will be smaller and one of them will be larger than the square root. And um, and that really knowing that really helps a lot because we could take the square root of six, six, seven and um, and then we can just try all the prime numbers that are smaller than that square root. Now let me uh, let me find my calculator here that I use. Here it is, 42. Okay, so six, six, seven, and uh, let's see. I'm looking for your square root. So the square root's 25.8. Okay, so we want to find prime numbers. Well, the first prime number smaller than 25, I think, is 23. So we find uh, 23 and then 19 and then 17. So there aren't that many primes to try. Once we find one prime number smaller than 25, that divides into 667, it's then easy to find the other prime number. So that's the idea here. And um, so we find those two answers. So let's see, is um, what is uh, solution two, solution three, solution four, okay. So looks like 23 actually divides into 667. We divide it into 667, we get 29. So these are the two prime numbers. And um, the reason why um, we want to be able to do things like find prime factors is because uh, this is the essence of doing 
public key encryption with the with the RSA algorithm is finding you want to find very 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 large prime numbers um, uh, two of them multiply them together to help us do the RSA public key encryption algorithm which I talked a bit about in class which is complicated and um, and you if uh, the, although I'm not asking you what the RSA algorithm is in this question, but the reason why I asked the question about the product of prime numbers is because it's important for public key encryption. And um, so uh, there, the uh, the way we did it was finding the square root of the number and then searching through all primes. Now, when we take really, really large prime uh, uh, primes and multiply them, it turns out that doing what we've just done here is in fact a very challenging computational problem uh, in that uh, to find the prime factors of a very, very large number. So if you have a large number that has many, many, many digits in it, let's say hundreds of digits, uh, finding two prime factors like this turns out to be an extremely difficult mathematical problem, which is what makes the RSA algorithm work, is the fact that finding these prime factors is almost impossible. But uh, in this case, it's obviously not impossible. It's pretty straightforward. So uh, the question number five I asked, would these be good uh, primes for implementing the RSA algorithm? And the answer is no, because it was easy to find them and they're relatively small. So that's why the answer is no. Also, uh, problem number six is related to public key encryption. What is Euler's Totian function? for 667. Now, again, the Euler's Totian function is something that comes up in the public key RSA algorithm. And we talked about that too. Um, and uh, you might have to go back and remind yourself what Euler's Totian function is. And uh, and remember, I've told you, and since you guys, uh, I'm sure, are quite good at using uh, Professor Google, um, go and go and, whenever you don't quite know how to do something, Google it. And, uh, or uh, I think even better is to go into uh, YouTube and do a YouTube search because actually YouTube is part of Google. And uh, because I've always found videos describing a concept are much more informative than finding a web page and then trying to read through the web page. So uh, my recommendation is you don't remember Euler's Totian function? Google it. It has to do with the uh, prime factors of a number. And um, in particular, if we have primes, it turns out that Euler's Totian function evaluated with a prime number is really easy to compute. And the, the answer is where we use this Greek uh, letter phi. So the phi of 667 is the phi of the product of these two primes which multiply together to give us 667. And the totian function of a prime is just one less than the prime. So the totian function of 23 is 22 and the totian function of 29 is 28. And because the Totian function has this property where the Totian function 
of a number can be written in terms of the Totian functions of its product, we can then just multiply 22 times 28 to find the Totian function for 667. So 